Thank you. 
Good evening. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, National Chair of A Women's Journey. On behalf of the Johns Hopkins Medicines of Women's Journey, thank you for joining this evening for our monthly webcast series, Conversations That Matter. A Woman's Journey strives to improve your well-being through health education. And tonight, we're pleased to talk about arthritis, which is so prevalent. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Dana Dorenzo, instructor of medicine, who cares for patients in the Division of Rheumatology. Following our conversation, Dr. Dorenzo will respond to many of your questions, so please use the Q&A on your screen to pose your questions throughout the evening. Our webcast will conclude at 8 p.m. tonight, and tomorrow you'll receive an email asking you to complete a brief survey about this webcast. In the coming days, the video of tonight's live streams will be available on the Women's Journey website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a women's journey under conversations that matter. I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for their production assistance. You can visit their website for additional lectures and courses throughout the year. And now I'm pleased to begin tonight's conversation with Dr. Dorenzo. Dr. Dorenzo. Thank you so much, Kelly. 
Um, as Kelly mentioned, I am an instructor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology. My clinical focus is inflammatory arthritis. I also run a musculoskeletal ultrasound clinic, um, and I see Sjogren's patients as well. Tonight, we're going to talk about arthritis, which is an incredibly broad topic. Uh, there are multiple, multiple different types of arthritis, over 100 types to be exact. I'm going to break it down into two major categories. And when you would be coming to the doctors, whether or not it's your primary care physician or whether or not it's to a rheumatologist, your doctor will be doing this um, and will be trying to decipher, is your arthritis a wear and tear type of arthritis or is your arthritis an inflammatory type of arthritis? Those are the two major categories. In the examples of each of those categories, osteoarthritis is a type of wear and tear, and rheumatoid arthritis is an example of inflammatory arthritis. So let me just take it back a step and discuss what is arthritis. So arthros or arthron is the Greek term for joint, bone, and itis is inflammation. So arthritis is inflammation of the joint. And it could be one joint, and we would refer to that as a single joint disease, a monoarthritis. It could be in multiple joints or a polyarticular multiple joint process. So that's another thing um, that your physician would be trying to figure out if your joints were hurting you and you were presenting to one of our clinics. So let's go into osteoarthritis in more detail. That is the most prevalent, the most common type of arthritis worldwide and in the United States as well. It is believed that millions of people have osteoarthritis and the risk for developing that increases with time. It increases with aging. There's approximately 300 people million wide who suffer from osteoarthritis, but I would guess that the number is even higher. Those are, that's just an estimate of the number of patients who are being treated but I would suspect that that number is even higher. So what are the factors that go into the development of osteoarthritis? How does someone develop this? So like we said before, osteoarthritis is a degeneration of the bone, of the joint. How your bone wears down is very genetically driven, however. So the way that your bone wears down over time, how you develop arthritis over time is very strongly family driven. And to give you some examples of this, they, this is uh, derived from multiple twin studies. So they took pairs of twins and they looked at the siblings and then they looked at different joints. So the hands, the knees, the hips, the spine, and they looked to see how similarly did these sets of siblings develop these particular um, types of arthritis in these joints? So for example, looking at osteoarthritis for the hands, 40% is genetically driven. So in our clinic, I use the expression where you get to your mom's hands or you get your parents' hands or you get your grandparents' hands. So I usually start off um, by asking my patient, what did your mother's hands look like? What did your grandmother's hands look like? So some of the joint um, deformities that you might develop with time due to an osteoarthritis is going to be genetically driven um, based on family genetics. Hands is 40%, knees 65% genetically driven. How your knees start to wear down over time, large genetic component. Hips and spine is even more. So 65% of how your uh, hips uh, wear down with time is also genetically driven and your spine 70% as well. So that is one factor. Genetics, one factor in how your joints wear down over time. What are some other factors that contribute to the development of osteoarthritis, which is the most common arthritis as we had mentioned? So let's think about the difference between men and women. Osteoarthritis is more common in women, and there are several reasons that that might be the case. 
In women in particular, we have fluctuating hormone levels. And we notice that the peak um, and the development of osteoarthritis tends to accelerate after menopause. So as estrogen levels start to come down, then sometimes the development of osteoarthritis starts to increase. So we see higher rates of development in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s in women compared to men. Now men tend to have a steady increase in the development of osteoarthritis throughout the decades. Women, unfortunately, due to hormone fluxes, tend to have an acceleration of development after menopause occurs. There's other factors that come into play with hormone fluxes as well. With hormone changes in some of the estrogen and estrogen-like hormones in particular, this could lead to joint laxity. So evolutionarily, this could be helpful when you are of childbearing years and having babies, you want your joints to be somewhat flexible in order to have a successful delivery. However, if your joints are lax, that can lead to excess friction. Excess motion of a joint leads to friction, which then could lead to arthritis. So if you think about your knees in particular, if this is the knee joint, so this is the top part of your leg, the bottom part of your leg, if there's excess motion, excess friction, that causes the bone, the cartilage surface to rub together. And if that process is uneven, leading to an uneven bony surface, that is arthritis forming. So the more lax your joints, the more arthritis process and formation can be accelerated. So I'm gonna pause and jump a little bit into treatment. We'll come back to that in a second, but just because we're talking about laxity, I would like to bring up, this is why it is so important and why your primary care physician and your rheumatologist pushes the notion of physical therapy. So let's come back to the knee joints again. So if you have the top part of your leg and the bottom part of your leg and it's lax, it's moving, we know that your joint's gonna be more unstable, more friction, more development of arthritis. So how do you stabilize that joint? So I get asked this question all the time um, my patients come in and see, say, I feel like my knee is going to give out. I feel like my knee is going to pop out. Well, I go up the steps and I feel like my joint is going to give. So there isn't a medical, a, a pill that you could take in order to improve that stability. What you do to improve that stability is strengthen the muscle surrounding the joint. So if you strengthen, for example, in the knee joint in particular, if you strengthen the quadriceps, so that's the top muscle group in your leg, um, and then uh, the gastrocnemius and the muscle groups at the lower part of your leg, if you strengthen up that muscle complex, the joint will be more stable. That will lead to less instability, less friction, and then therefore less pain. So the more stable you make your joint, the less painful it will become. So I say, don't shoot the messenger when my patients come to clinic, but the first thing I'm gonna tell you to do is physical therapy or any type of exercises that's gonna to lead to increased stability of the joint. All right, let's, get, let's take a step back again and then think a little bit more about gender differences in terms of osteoarthritis formation. So I had mentioned hormones are a large reason for differences. Another reason is more anatomic. So men tend to have a thicker or a greater degree of cartilage than women do. So when we think about knees or hips in general, they have more ability or a larger amount of cartilage to wear um, before it gets onto that terminology we call bone on bone. So anatomic di differences is also a reason why women tend to develop osteoarthritis with, at an accelerated rate compared to men. And then finally, mechanically speaking, women um, sometimes tend to have increased adipose tissue compared to men naturally, and this is related to hormone levels. Increased adipose tissue actually leads to an inflammatory response. So low-grade inflammation can accelerate your chondrocytes, which are your bone cells, 
increased bone remodeling, and then sometimes bone breakdown leading to um, an accelerated osteoarthritic process. So several different factors, several different mechanisms um, to think about when you're thinking about the difference between how osteoarthritis forms in women compared to men. So that's osteoarthritis in general. What may a patient with osteoarthritis experience? So pain, which may be obvious. So you may experience pain in a particular joint. Sometimes patients might not have pain, but they may have swelling or stiffness. So for osteoarthritis in general, the classic description that I get in my clinic is, I start my day, I'm feeling okay, I get going with my activities, and by the end of the day, my joints are incredibly painful, are very stiff, and sometimes I have a difficult time getting comfortable lying flat in bed or going to sleep. This is important because it's much different than the description for an inflammatory arthritis. So I didn't talk about that yet. The inflammatory arthritis example would be rheumatoid arthritis, but that patient might say, my joints are incredibly swollen. I wake up in the morning and it takes a very long time to get moving, but then with activity, I begin to feel better. So I am feeling better throughout the day. I actually feel my best in afternoon and evening, which is much different than a wear and tear of this osteoarthritis process. So if you wanna think about it like this, if you have an uneven bony surface, a degenerated cartilage and, and a degenerated joint, the more activity you're doing, the more friction, the more painful the process. So by the end of the day, your joints are not feeling good where someone where their joints are inflamed, they don't necessarily have that uneven surface to their bone. The more they work out that swelling, by the end of the day, they're feeling better. So those are the broad differences in terms of description between degenerative arthritis and inflammatory arthritis. So um, next, I would like to talk a little bit um, about the differences in what your hands may look like. So hand osteoarthritis or hand inflammatory arthritis um, is probably one of the most prevalent set of joints um, or the most pressing set of joints we like to tune up, if you will. So when you come to clinic, we wanna make sure that we have your hands optimally functioning. So what might the differences look like between an osteoarthritic hand and a rheumatoid arthritis hand? it's going to be a different set of joints. So looking at your hands in general, in osteoarthritis, the, the joints that tend to be affected and that you would see bony enlargement tend to be this row of joints. So your distal row of joints. In rheumatoid arthritis, for example, it is much different and you would see this middle row of joints. So your metacarpal phalangeal joints. The middle row here, the proximal interphalangeal joints, the PIP, may be affected in either scenario. So thinking about your hand again, so just to recap, your distal row of joints tends to be osteoarthritic. This row here, your metacarpal phalangeal joints tends to be an inflammatory arthritis. The row in between can be either osteoarthritic or an inflammatory process. And the difference in feeling would be for osteoarthritis, it tends to feel hard. So it's a bony overgrowth. So evolutionarily, your body due to the friction and the uneven bone surface that's forming due to a wear and tear, your body says, well, I'll build up extra bone. That'll be helpful. But oftentimes it is unhelpful in the sense that if that bone formation then starts to pinch on the very tiny nerve receptor surrounding the joint that could lead to pain. This is opposed to rheumatoid arthritis where it's not gonna feel bony. It's gonna feel very squishy, very squishy and swollen. So if you wanted to at home right now, examine your own joints, when you come to our clinic to do an, a joint exam. So if you look at your hand like this, the joint line is actually right below your knuckle. So if you started 
palpating or pushing on the space in between, that's your true joint. So when you come to a rheumatologist clinic, they're always taking your hands and massaging your hands and feeling your joints. So we're trying to feel the grooves in between. Does this feel squishy or does this feel bony? And that's the major difference. All right, on to treatments um, of osteoarthritis. So I fortunately was um, able to be part of this incredible project. Uh, so it took us well over a year to go back and look at every clinical trial, every major study that was published in osteoarthritis treatment to date. And it was a major, major undertaking. The final count of papers was somewhere in the tens of thousands, but we distilled it down into two simple tables, two simple guidelines or diagrams that voices the most efficacious treatments for osteoarthritis. So green, the darker green is a strong recommendation. So out of all the papers we read, we summarized the still down, uh, the darker green is a strong recommendation for the most effective treatments for treating pain and improving function. The light green is a conditional recommendation, meaning that the majority of the papers were efficacious, maybe a paper here and there did not show a strong effect. So thinking about hand, knee and hip osteoarthritis treatment, what's at the top of this list? Exercise. So exercise is a fantastic way to help with bone strength, bone remodeling, keeping the muscles tone in order to improve joint stability. So aside from any medication you may be treating for, taking for your arthritis, exercise is going to be incredibly important to augment this process. Other things that are strongly recommended, particularly if you have end-stage osteoarthritis. So that's what physicians may refer to as bone on bone. This is called self-efficacy and self-management programs. Essentially, we've found that group programs, group exercise programs, group educational programs, uh, and self-coaching programs are important to help you cope with some of the pain and maybe some of the physical dysfunction that accompanies arthritis. So if you have support in place to help you, this is going to help you better deal with some of the unfortunate downsides to arthritis like pain and maybe uh, loss of function. I briefly mentioned before weight loss, diet, that's also key for weight dependent joints. So these would be your knees and your hips, ankles and feet, but I didn't mention as much. So the study that's typically cited in terms of knee osteoarthritis is one pound of weight is equivalent to four to five pounds of vertical force on the knee. So losing something like five pounds is equivalent to losing 20 to 25 pounds of force off of your knees. So this is also something that your primary care physician and rheumatologist would be recommending. Other things that have been found to be beneficial, Tai Chi, which is a Chinese martial art. These, there are community programs also available. Um, if you're unfamiliar, the NIH uh, Complementary Medicine Division also has some video tutorials of Tai Chi programs, but I would encourage you to also Google in your particular area, any type of um, beginner groups, um, if you have an interest in that. And then using, if recommended to you, perhaps from a physical therapist or occupational therapist, a cane, a knee brace, thumb brace, hand brace in particular, that could be particularly useful for your osteoarthritis as well. Heat and cold. Um, so depending on what your preference is, can also be helpful to manage the pain. Acupuncture, um, which is sometimes covered by your insurance, could be helpful for pain related to osteoarthritis. Taping, which is usually taught to you in physical therapy. So taping your knee joint, um, sometimes taping um, your hands or other joints in particular could be helpful. 
If you have loss of balance or feel unstable due to hip osteoarthritis or knee osteoarthritis, balance training, gait training through physical therapy can also be very important. So I'm just going to come back to the notion again, medications can help you with pain, may help with the joint progression. But if you have instability to a weakened muscle, um, the only thing that's going to help with that is exercise and physical therapy to strengthen, to improve stability. And the same thing, if this has been present for years and your balance might be a little bit off due to this process, it might be helpful to relearn a gait in order to help you feel more stable on your feet. And then other modalities conditionally recommend it, paraffin. So this is somewhat of a little spa treatment. So particularly for hand osteoarthritis, if you were to go to occupational therapy, they would put your hands in a hot wax bath, wrap them, and then do a warm um, towel massage in order to help with some of that pain that you might have in your hands. Yoga is a great total body workout um, that is joint um, stabilizing and, and um, could help with stability as well. And then RFA, which stands for radio frequency ablation. This in particular is used more in the setting of end-stage osteoarthritis, common in knees in particular. So what it is, is um, if you have very severe bone on bone uh, deformity in your knees, for example, your knee capsule is surrounded by your genicular nerve, or let's just say nerves in general. Radio frequency ablation ablates the nerves, the nerve endings surrounding the joint, so you don't sense pain as intensely. So it's not something you're gonna to go to as a first strategy, but let's say you wanted to stave off a joint replacement. Let's say, I just don't wanna get my knees replaced. I wanna keep trying to do things that may help with my pain. Radio frequency ablation is often used in this setting. Moving down the list to speak just a little bit about medications that could be helpful, oral NSAIDs. So this is your Advil, um, naproxen, and then there's prescription NSAIDs that your physician might give you as well. Just being mindful that um, you have normal kidney function and you are not on any oral anticoagulation that may preclude you from taking NSAIDs. Topical NSAIDs can also be very helpful. Topical NSAIDs are now over the counter diclofenac gel, which you could apply directly to the joint and could be very effective. IA stands for intraarticular steroid injections. So that would be coming to a rheumatologist clinic or sometimes orthopedic could do this for you and having steroid injections directly to the joint. And then other treatment strategies include Tylenol, that's acetaminophen, Tramadol, that's a stronger pain reliever, Duloxetine, the brand name of that is Cymbalta. This is a medication that recently made it into the guidelines. And when you think about osteoarthritis in general, there was um, a lack of response for some individuals in terms of traditional pain medications. And more so lately, it's the recognition that your joints are surrounded by tiny nerve endings. And sometimes you need to dampen the nerve endings in order to better treat the pain. So we started using in rheumatology in particular, neuropathic agents. So agents that dampen those nerve fibers such as duloxetine to help with this process. So we use duloxetine in particular a lot for knee osteoarthritis, especially that's not responding well to an ibuprofen. And then finally, topical capsaicins. So I just wanted to bring up this just to highlight things that did not make the guideline that actually had lack of evidence, but that many individuals, a lot of patients who are coming to my clinic say, hey, I've been trying this, or hey, should I take this? And some of them are very surprising. So just to briefly run down this list, uh, glucosamine did not sh has not been shown to be effective for pain or function for osteoarthritis. Some immunosuppressants, which is not too surprising. This is not a systemic inflammatory process. So 
immunosuppressants such as methotrexate, TNF inhibitors, IL-1 receptor antagonists have not been shown to be helpful. Platelet-rich plasma injections into the joint, which were being done um, in orthopedics, not shown to reduce pain or function in osteoarthritis. Stem cell injections, not shown to reduce pain or function in osteoarthritis. Chondroitin hasn't been shown to be effective. And then hyaluronic acid injections into the knees, this is Synvis, has not been shown to be effective at reducing pain or function. So as part of the guidelines, again, updated in 2019, we wanted to include this um, to just highlight things that are not necessarily worthwhile in um, treating pain and function as associated with osteoarthritis. So at this point, I just want to pivot to that other category of arthritis, inflammatory arthritis. So we talked a lot about osteoarthritis because it's the most prevalent. Much less frequently does an individual develop an inflammatory arthritis. And the example of that is rheumatoid arthritis present in less than 1% of the US population. Women tend to be affected with more severe disease in terms of pain than men. And similar to osteoarthritis, there's a lot of different factors associated with that. So hormonal factors, um, sometimes when you are developing an inflammatory arthritis, it tends to be or can be during uh, childbearing years, which then can impact the treatment. So typically you would be started on immunosuppression in order to help with this process, but that cannot necessarily be taken if you're having a baby or breastfeeding. So sometimes there's a differential in terms of treatment at the development of rheumatoid arthritis that could lead to this um, ambiguity in terms of outcomes. And then finally, um, there could be different genetic components that aren't fully understood yet that go into, uh, that come into play. So I talked a little bit about my hands, but just show you a visual, the difference in a rheumatoid arthritis hand compared to an osteoarthritis hand. So very prominent swelling in this top row of joints here, the metacarpal phalangeal joints. I do show this picture on the screen um, and point out that when individuals with new rheumatoid come to my clinic, I say, we are gonna work together and I don't believe your hands will ever look like this. So treatment for rheumatoid arthritis is amazing. To date, um, the first biologic agents came out in 1998. And over the last 20 years, there are over 20 to 30 that are on the market and more in the pipeline. They're highly effective at controlling inflammation within the joint. So the issue and the concern with an inflammatory arthritis, which means your body's immune system is ramped up producing antibodies, which is a component um, of the immune system that could attack the joints. It's a systemic whole body inflammation. Um, and what needs to happen is taking an immunosuppressant tones down the immune system in order to prevent that swelling occurring in the joint. Over time, if the swelling persisted, that could lead to bony changes, possible erosions, um, and joint deformity. However, being connected with your primary care physician and then with a rheumatologist is incredibly helpful. If you get into clinic early, get started on these medications early, you conceivably would never have any joint deformity. And that's the goal. So if you were coming to a rheumatology clinic, we say your goal is remission. I do think in the future, um, there's multiple different categories of immunosuppressants that continue to be brought to market. Um, many on the pipeline now and in terms of prevention strategy. So knowing if your immune system has any type of dysfunction or has any of these antibodies getting started on treatment earlier and earlier could sometimes lead to prevention um, of any disease progression or swelling. So it's an exciting time in the field of rheumatology. Uh, and I look forward to continue being a rheumatologist for the upcoming years, just learning about all the new medications that are coming down the pipeline. And this is an example, I just want to show you two on, on, on this slide and the next slide, examples of what I'm talking about in terms of the bony changes that could be occurring in a rheumatoid arthritis process compared to an osteoarthritis. 
So this red arrow is pointing towards the joints that are most commonly affected, which is this top row here, the MCPs. You could see that the joints um, in the middle, the third finger, uh, a lot of extra white, a white part to that x-ray. So the bone is building up due to all that swelling that's surrounding it and erosions are starting to form. And that is different than in, in osteoarthritis where you might just see the bone beginning to be smushed together. So a loss of joint space due to a wear and tear. And this is an ultrasound. So in my clinic, I do ultrasound of all the joints. This is, is an example of swelling of the swelling of the joint that is occurring. So in the top part of the screen, A, so the A square, that's an example of early rheumatoid in the sense that the white line um, connected to the white line is the joint and that black area above is the swelling. So you could see progression from A to B to C um, how the joint tissue begins to spread and grow. And that's what we're trying to augment with our different forms of immunosuppression in rheumatoid arthritis. We're trying to get that swelling under control so it doesn't lead to any damage or erosion of the bone. So just to recap and summarize, I'm not going to go into the specific treatments of rheumatoid arthritis um, as it gets quite complex and it's very individually driven. Um, so it's not a cookie cutter approach, especially when it comes to an inflammatory arthritis. But just to recap, rheumatoid arthritis, an example of an inflammatory arthritis, is a type of process that is autoimmune. So you have circulating autoantibodies in your bloodstream, a dysfunction of the immune system where your body starts attacking the joint tissue specifically. This would be characterized by prominent swelling of the joints that ten and the pain and stiffness associated with that tends to get better throughout the day and with activity. This type of arthritis is treated with immunosuppression because it is a dysfunction of the immune system and it's highly inflammatory. This is contrasted with osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is not a systemic inflammatory response. It's a local degeneration of the bone with friction that sometimes could lead to a very small localized inflammation, but not systemic. If you took a blood sample from someone with osteoarthritis, you would not see elevations in your inflammatory markers. So a wear and tear um, that is genetically driven, so how your joints wear with time is genetically driven. The pain tends to be worse by evening, so with activity, and that, and the treatment strategy for that tends to be um, modifying pain and strengthening the joint. So strengthening with exercise and other different modalities. Unfortunately, there is not a medication on the market, but perhaps in the works that augments the osteoarthritis process. At this point, our strategies are pain management with the multiple different modalities that I had spoken about. So at this time, I will pause um, for any questions that will be led by Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Duranzo. Really terrific information and, and a lot. <laughs> now before, before we begin to take some questions though, from the viewing audience, I have a few questions. So COVID is at the top of everyone's mind. Are you at greater risk if you have arthritis and, and two-part question, and also if you contract COVID, can it lead to arthritic flare-up? Right. So if you have arthritis, that would not put you at risk of developing COVID. However, if you are someone, an individual who has an inflammatory arthritis, let's say rheumatoid arthritis, contracting COVID um, can lead to a flare of your disease. COVID is a highly inflammatory type of infection. So when, um, if you unfortunately suffer from COVID, it mounts a highly inflammatory response in the body, which then could trigger some of these inflammatory cascades that we know are present in, let's say, rheumatoid arthritis. So just having arthritis doesn't make you susceptible, but unfortunately, if you were to contract, sometimes that could flare your disease. Sure, makes sense, thank you. And also, how can we reduce inflammation? I, I know you touched briefly on dietary, lifestyle or medical recommendations to re reduce inflammation. And recently um, I read about the inflammatory properties of what they call 
nightshade vegetables, for example. Can you briefly touch on that? Okay, so nightshade um, or tomatoes would be in that category. They are actually thought to be inflammatory. So foods in general, um, you should be aware of um, certain triggers. Uh, so I encourage everyone um, to go through the process of learning what foods may trigger your joints in particular. Um, and there's certain processes or diets that could help with that. So for example, the Whole30 diet, which is um, a form of an anti-inflammatory diet, you will eliminate certain foods and then you slowly add them back to decipher what might be a trigger for your joint. So for example, nightshades trigger some patients arthritis and actually some patients lupus, although that's not the focus of our talk. Um, the most well-studied um, and the most impactful type of anti-inflammatory diet is the Mediterranean diet. Mm -hmm. So the Mediterranean diet is shown um, for individuals to do it long-term to lower levels of inflammation with time. So I often get asked this question multiple times a week, what diet should I be following as someone who might, may have a rheumatic disease? So I recommend the Mediterranean diet, which is a lot of oily fishes, um, many vegetables, avoidance largely of red meats, um, and then uh, whole foods and grains with the avoidance of anything processed. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. With the exception of tomatoes, because I think you yes. said they were <laughs> inflammatory, is that correct? Yes. With the exception of tomatoes, <laughs> right, but that's hard to do. Um, right. It's a plus or minus. <laughs> exactly. Um, so thank you for that. We're gonna take some questions from our, our viewers right now. So Gwen wants to know, so you talked a little bit about genetics. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we can do that can you know, help us to perhaps not fall into the footsteps, for lack of a better word, of our, of our parents? Right. And, or, or is there really, or there really isn't? Is it just, you know, it's genetics and that's that? So what I tell my patients is, unfortunately you can't change your genes, but you could be very aware of them. Mm -hmm. So I try to very carefully go over family trees in my appointments um, because it brings to light perhaps some of the issues that may be causing pain or joint issues for a particular individual. So if you're aware of your family tree, particularly those highly genetic joints like your spine, your hips, your knees, and you see how that has affected your parents or potentially grandparents, et cetera, you could do everything um, in your control and your ability to modify that with uh, lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, maintaining a healthy weight is incredibly important on your larger joints, um, as I had mentioned before, and then having or tried some of these anti-inflammatory diets, or at least um, having a clean diet can be helpful. So you mm -hmm. want to modify anything that potentially could be leading um, to further stress on the joints. You can't modify genetics. So you could tell your parents that, but um, you can be aware of the situation and do everything on your part to stay healthy. Sure. So with that, that also when, falls into exercise for a minute. Like, so when people say like you talked about doing yoga um, or Tai Chi, what about the repetitiveness of doing the same thing? You know, we're kind of in a culture here in America, I find, and I'm, I'm just as guilty, you know, doing the same thing over and over and over again. And is that helpful or hurtful to particular joints? Yeah, so repetitive um, motions um, are, are actually fine. So you just have to enjoy the exercise that you're doing. So the most important thing is just engaging in something you like and keeping that habit and whatever that may be, be is gonna be helpful. There's always mixed studies and the perfect example of a repetitive exercise is marathons. So there's um, mixed studies in terms of do marathon runners have accelerated osteoarthritis in their knees or do they not? Some say they do, some say they don't. Some say the cutoff is 20 miles you know, per day. So, you know, so it's very right. mixed. So the point being is you just have to engage in an exercise you like to do in order to keep yourself healthy. And that's the most important part. Great. Uh, let's see. Gail, and let's see here, just lost. Gail would like to know, and I, excuse me if I mispronounce this, what are Herbert Den's nodes? I don't know if I said that right. And can you minimize them and can they disappear? Haberden's nodes. Um, so this is um, 
an example, a very severe osteoarthritis of the hand. So this distal um, joint, your DIP, distal inter interphalangeal joint, if you were to have bony overgrowth, it's called the Heberden's nodes. So Dr. Heberden um, was the person who first named that. If you had bony overgrowth in this middle, middle row of joints here, it would be, be Bouchard's nodes, but a Heberden's node is just a bony overgrowth of that distal joint of your hand. And do they disappear? Or if you have they do not disappear. So mm -hmm. I kind of briefly mention this. So as part of evolution, any site of increased friction, so joints, your body um, thought it would manage best by building up extra bone. However, that extra bone buildup then may lead to pain and discomfort over time because then it starts pinching on the tiny little nerve receptors and fibers that surround the joints. So your body thought it was being helpful by, by building up that um, bony overgrowth, but unfortunately not so. Right. So question from Joyce, should you drink alcohol while on methodextrate? So that's a specific question. And according to the guidelines, alcohol should be minimized. So what, um, what this per individual is alluding to. So methotrexate is a common immunosuppressant used in inflammatory arthritis. And methotrexate is a medication that is metabolized in the liver. So anything that puts excess strain on the liver um, should be minimized. So alcohol also process, processed in the liver. And for that reason, we usually stay to minimize alcohol use. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Let's see. Um, Lauren would like to know, what is the most important thing to avoid to decrease the trauma of arthritis? Um, trauma of arthritis, uh, I, perhaps this person is alluding to like a repetitive motion, you trauma, like trauma to the joints. Perhaps it does. Um, sorry, no specifics, but, um, I would guess that's probably what it is. What is the most important thing to avoid to decrease the trauma of arthritis? So I think okay. the repetitiveness there. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so generally um, if there is any type of repetitive strain on the joint. So let's say, for example, let's talk about your thumbs just because the slide up is up right now. So the incidence um, of thumb osteoarthritis is increasing rapidly, exponentially in the setting of everyone texting. So here is, if we think about this as a repetitive motion, so you're using your thumbs all the time, that strain, that constant strain. Um, so it has a buildup that extra bone buildup. Again, your body thinks it's helpful, but it's really not. So if you have any irregularity of that bone buildup at the base of your thumb, because you're always using your thumbs, um, that could lead to a pain. So common site of repetitive motion leading to this. What can you do to calm down that joint if you have a flare of that in particular? Thumb braces. So anything that's gonna stabilize the uh, joint, let it heal for a little bit um, is going to be helpful. Knee braces can be helpful, for example, if you have any laxity to the knee, you've injured it due to whatever repetitive motion. Um, mm -hmm. So anything you could do to stabilize having proper footwear, making sure your gait is in, a, is in alignment, not throwing off your knee or your hip alignment um, is important as well. So I would say the most important thing to prevent trauma or repetitive motion injury would be stability, stability coming from whatever device may be necessary. Great. Thank you. Fran would like to know, what is a biologic? A biologic agent is a specialized immunosuppression. So this is used for inflammatory arthritis and examples of biological agents. They're called biological because it is a, a engineered antibody. Uh, so without getting too complicated, I had mentioned that, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis, you may have circulating antibodies that are formed by your body and then attack the joints. To combat that, biological agents or biologically engineered antibodies are then administered in order to um, offset that and hopefully halt that inflammatory process. So examples of biological agents are Humira, Enbrel, Cosentix, the list goes on, and I'm sure we've all seen multiple commercials for them. Right. Thank you. Question from Maud, is shoulder arthritis common? Shoulder arthritis is also very common. 
Uh, so again, we use our arms all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And depending on what type of um, job you may have had, or if you've done any type of manual labor or any, again, repetitive motion for your shoulder, that can wear down with time. Uh, so it is incredibly common on a joint to be affected. And I see this um, appointment frequently in my clinic. So shoulder arthritis also very common. Great. Question from Linda, what are the primary downsides of knee cortisone injections and how frequently should you have shots? So the general rule of thumb with knee or any type of intraarticular injection um, is to limit it no more frequently than approximately every three months. Keeping in mind that the more you inject that particular joint, the more that it could lead to slight bone wear down. So if, for example, um, everything is a risk and benefit. If, for example, you have very severe osteoarthritis, let's say of the knee, and you're trying to avoid a joint replacement, or just say, I'm never going to get a joint replacement. Knee injections, that would be an unlimited number because you're never, the end result of wearing down your bone is never going to then force you into having a surgery if you've already decided that that is not what you want. So unlimited number in certain situations, but the general rule of thumb would be every three months or so. Other downsides would be uh, for example, if you are a diabetic, uh, it is less systemic absorption than taking an oral steroid, um, but there is some overlap, um, some seeding into the bloodstream so it could raise your blood sugar. Um, if you're someone with hypertension, a little bit of steroid in your bloodstream could raise your um, blood pressure. Uh, sometimes having a steroid injection, um, let's say if it's a very superficial joint, you're having steroid injection into your finger, into your wrist, it could lead to a lightening or change in pigmentation over that underlying skin area. Um, but otherwise it's incredibly effective, effective for treating pain in that particular joint. Sure. Thank you. From B, what causes the absence of arthritis? The absence of our youth? <laughs> I don't know, the absence <laughs> of youth? <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Unfortunately, we okay. all, all of us will suffer from at least a slight degree of arthritis with time, unless you're incredibly lucky genetically. Yeah. I, I think that's probably what that question was about. Is, is there any way to avoid ever having arthritis? But, um, I don't just, think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, from Catherine, is it possible to have both kinds of arthritis? Yes. That's incredibly common. And that's um, part of the puzzle. And that's part of the fun about being a rheumatologist. So sometimes having an inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis, um, because you're also aging, you're also accruing just wear and tear damage, osteoarthritis as well. Sometimes having an inflammatory process can lead to a wear down of your joint. Maybe we get the inflammation under control, but then unfortunately there's a byproduct of that. Um, and, and that is considered a degenerative arthritis. But yes, it is incredibly common um, for a patient with any type of inflammatory arthritis to also have osteoarthritis. Great, thank you. Question from Marion, must exercise be weight bearing or can swimming and cycling help as well? No, it could be not non weight bearing as well. Although I will say um, for your knees, hips in particular, um, once you've advanced for example, through a water therapy regimen um, with physical therapy, then it will start to become weight bearing exercises because that leads to bone remodeling and that bone formation buildup leading to stability. Um, mm -hmm. But anything that you enjoy doing, cycling, swimming is going to be fantastic. Wonderful. I would think so. Any type of exercise, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, a question from Orlando, are the level of calcium and collagen determining factors in the risk of acquiring rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, that does not play into the risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis. It is really um, a particular gene group in your immune system, um, your HLA um, group of genes um, in your immune system. That is the biggest risk factor for having a rheumatoid arthritis. And then it typically is a stressor on the body, whether or not um, it's a stressor psychologically, a stressor such as an infection, a stressor such as smoking um, that could trigger your immune system to then 
become more and more dysfunctional leading to heightened levels of inflammation. Great, thank you. This is from Barbara. Does arthritis show up on a regular x-ray or do you need other tests? So that's a great question. So osteoarthritis will show up on a regular x-ray. So osteoarthritis, again, is that wear and tear arthritis. For example, this is an x-ray right here of an osteoarthritic um, hand. Inflammatory arthritis, especially if it's early, may not show up on an x-ray. You may get an x-ray in early rheumatoid arthritis that looks normal. And the difference is there's swelling of that joint tissue. So that is your golden opportunity. If you treat the joint tissue, it may never lead to the bony changes, the bony erosions from an excessively prolonged period of inflammation. So especially early on disease, you can, you can have a normal x-ray, but still have an inflammatory process. The different modalities that are going to tell that apart is going to be an ultrasound. So that's why coming to a rheumatologist would be key. A rheumatologist can perform an ultrasound of your joints to look for that swelling in particular, especially if an x-ray would be normal. MRI is another imaging modality that would be able to look at inflammation compared to just the bone outline of an x-ray. Okay, thank you. Ken, um, actually there's a question from Rita. Can the COVID vaccine aggravate the inflammatory arthritis? So now the actual vaccine. The uh, there are mixed results. So the COVID vaccine may, if you as an individual, which is hard to predict how you're going to respond to the vaccine, we're learning more and more about that, potentially mm -hmm. could flare, um, could, tend to put, could potentially flare in inflammatory arthritis. However, most in, it's a very uh, different across the spectrum of how individuals are reacting in terms of the vaccines they've been getting. The guidelines um, and the recommendations of the American College of Rheumatology are to proceed with vaccination if you have rheumatic disease for a host of other factors, most of them being that you are on immunosuppressants that would make you um, potentially more susceptible to the COVID disease in general. But um, it's plus or minus whether or not that would flare your joints. I've seen some individuals react and some individuals who did not react. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dorenzo. So we're gonna do a quick, um, some rapid questions um, quickly. <laughs> so uh, can you prevent the spread of arthritis to other joints? You cannot necessarily prevent um, the spread because again, it's a little bit genetically driven, but you can modify how quickly it may develop in terms of lifestyle, diet, exercise changes. Mm -hmm. What are the treatments for arthritis, which you, you did already mention a few of them, but one of them in particular, the PRP, the protein rich plasma, uh, can that be injected between the joints to help replace the previous cartilage and relieve arthritis? Yeah, so that's the one of them that made it to that conditional recommended against. So in that red table I had shown mm -hmm. in the studies that were aggregated, PRP injections did not show, have not been shown to improve pain or function. Right. I think you talked about braces too. Were they helpful or not helpful? Can you just- Braces are helpful. Yes, braces were on the green, um, the green table. So would you say you talked about heat and cold is one better than the other or not really? No, it's your, your personal preference. Personal preference. And then with medications, Tylenol or Advil is one better than the other? So no, they're both under guidelines and considered standard of care for either. It's what you find effective. And again, um, considering if you have any reasons to not take an NSAID, um, which is if you're on a blood thinner or potentially have any kidney issues. Okay. What about anti-inflammatory or other prescription medications? Any so that's going to, yeah. So that depends on the type of arthritis you have. Okay. When you experience pain, do you stop what you are doing or do you work through the pain? So I typically recommend, particularly in exercise, working through the pain, because again, that's going to be very healthy for the bone, healthy for the joint. Obviously, you don't want to um, go overboard, but it is um, generally beneficial to push through an exercise in order to make your joint more stable. Mm -hmm. I think I know the answer to this, but does mindfulness or meditation help or both? Yeah. So mindfulness meditation is, um, an area of interest for me. It's an area of mind research. Um, so mindfulness meditation can be incredibly effective for helping 
with pain. So retraining your thoughts, engaging in um, present moment awareness, retraining your thoughts to stay, um, uh, avoiding future thoughts. Okay, uh, how bad are my joints going to get? How much pain am I going to have? What aren't I going to be able to do? And avoiding thinking about the past. Oh, this flare was so bad, but retraining your thoughts to stay in the present can be very helpful in terms of pain control. It also has been shown to help with um, fatigue and other symptoms that could be associated with arthritis. So I encourage you, if you're interested, um, to check out any type of group or application-based mindfulness meditation um, exercises. Wonderful. Just a couple of two quick questions because we're running out of time, but is an old, it's an old wise tale that cracking your knuckles increases the odds of developing arthritis. Is this true or false? That is an old wives tale. So the <laughs> sounds that emanate from your joints are not necessarily related to what's going on in the actual joint. Right. And so last question, um, when do you need to see a rheumatologist and what do they offer? So you need to see a rheumatologist if you have persistent pain or swelling in the joint, particularly um, if your primary care physician is unsure of next steps. A rheumatologist can offer a dedicated specific joint exam as well as the ultrasound. Um, so looking at your joints for those specific pockets of inflammation that a primary care physician wouldn't necessarily be trained to do. Wonderful. Well, it looks like we've run out of time and I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Dorenzo, for all your help this evening, wonderful information. And for all of you for joining us as well, Dr. Dorenzo has graciously agreed to try to respond to any unanswered questions you may have asked this evening. And in a couple of weeks, you'll receive an email with her, with her responses. If you've enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a women's journey to watch for announcements about future conversations, podcasts, and special programs brought to you by A Women's Journey. In the meantime, we hope you will find our monthly email informative and engaging. Conversations That Matter is brought to you in part through a non-restrictive educational grant from Bristol Myers Squibb. Have a good night and stay well.